Would you like to hear about strategy? Wouldn't it be great to hear from Gary Kasparov himself when it comes to strategy? Shall we welcome him? Gary Kasparov! I should, I should yeah, mention I, one I, more thing. Yeah, you know, we're going to have a Q&A session in the end. Yeah, I, and Al Freyand, you know, the, the crazy... By the way, I wanted to say that you're lucky because, you know, I heard stories that many parents lost their sons at early age. You did too. You won against your no. dad. Yeah, I guess. Unfortunately, my dad died before oh, I could sorry. beat him. All right. Anyway, All right. but he did important things. He, he taught me how to play chess. He taught you how to play chess? Yes. He taught you me. know, great seeing you again. Hashtag NB2015. And, and Alf will be back here with Q&A later on. Okay. Um, Good afternoon. It's um, nice to be here, back in Finland, or as Finland was called Russian television today, Northern, Western, Greater Russia. <laughs> Actually, it's a joke, today. But I could see some people that took it seriously. Um, I know that the hottest issue, political issue in the European Union and in Finland as well as you know, refugees, hundreds of thousands of refugees. So I have to warn you that if you see a few thousand men in green crawling across the border from Russia, they're not refugees. <laughs> okay, um, just, you know, you heard the introduction, very short introduction, I love short introductions. My greatest nightmare to hear a long introduction where information is taken from Wikipedia or other inter, uh, internet sources, and uh, I'm scared to death to learn something new about myself. Uh, so I was presented as somebody who knows um, something about strategy, yeah, and, um, and uh, I, um, as you also heard, um, had other activities after quitting professional chess, and my interests range from uh, uh, artificial intelligence to human rights, and I'll try to cover all these elements. But my first language, my first window that shaped my view to the world was chess. And I was lucky. Yeah, it's the game, you know, just uh, taught me a lot. And uh, first, you know, before we move into discussing different strategy elements, I want to say, why chess? Uh, many people think that chess is it's some kind of, you know, obscure game. Of course, it cannot compete with popularity of the game invented here in Finland called Angry Birds. Uh, but okay, we are still, still kicking, and uh, the game of chess is about, you know, 1,500 years old. So we'll see what happens with Angry Birds in the next 15 years. Uh, uh, but um, uh, it's, it's actually, it's amazing that chess is so popular everywhere. So with this, when you look at Hollywood, for instance, so the moment they want, you know, the producers, the, the actors, they want to present an intellect, you know, someone who is just so, you know, uh, uh, intellectual, uh, smart, they use chess. See, Harry Potter, that comes from the book. You know, you have to pass a, a chess test before getting to sort of to, to the end of your journey. My, one of my favorite movies, Casablanca, Humphrey Bogart playing chess at the openings of, the, of this movie. By the way, for anybody who plays chess, the position there, actually I tried to look at this, it's a real one. It was a very important theoretical position from French defense uh, at, at that time in 1941. And Humphrey Bogart was quite, you know, a chess fan. Um, next picture, if you recognize it, even vampires play chess. And of course, the Terminator. Yeah, it was a friendly draw. And I, I can tell you, six months after making this draw, he became the governor of California. <laughs> uh, but chess is used not only in Hollywood, it's also in advertising. See the picture? So it's all over the place, you know, chess, chess, chess. And my favorite one, it's uh, like, you know, advertising war. You know, on one side, you could see, um, your move. On the other side, checkmate. Guess who won? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and uh, um, in my view, just it proves that chess, the reputation of chess as the ultimate sign of intellect sort of supersede dramatically the, the way that the game is perceived by the uh, general public. Um, and um, when I left professional chess, I thought it would be good to summarize my experience and uh, to bring it together uh, in a book. Um, it's about decision making. Because I, uh, when I played throughout my professional career, somebody calculated I made um, 89,612 moves. So each move has a decision. Some of them are trivial when you do the openings and, or the final stage of the game. Some of them are pretty obvious. Some of them are unique and original. But each of these moves is a decision. And it's like decisions we made on, you know, on, our, on, on a daily basis. Um, here is the, the book, several languages. Uh, uh, it's 24 languages in total. In some countries, I had to take the word of the publisher. It was my book. Uh, not, I, I could read many languages, but not all of them. Um, and um, this book, it's not the book of tips. The question which annoys me often is when I'm being asked, Mr. Kasparov, can you give us a tip? You know, how to get you know, better in making decisions? And my answer is, it's impossible. You know, it's like asking you know, the whole audience, asking you know, about you know, the best advice, sort of how to treat a certain illness. Because before we look for, for a remedy, we should go through the blood test. We should do certain things to understand what works for us. Something which works for me may not work for you, or even worse. So decision-making is as unique as fingerprints or DNA. We're all different. So that's why the way we make decisions is different. And uh, trying to just to give a universal advice, it's, um, I think it's at least is counterproductive. Uh, so uh, the book is, as I said, it's not a recommendation to play chess, though it's not a bad idea. At least you can be proud playing with your kids. Uh, but uh, um, it's about um, learning about yourself. So it's, um, it's looking inside. That's my advice, because the, the, the first step to become a good decision maker is to understand who you are. And we, again, as I said, we're all different. But, you know, looking inside and, and, and making this, you know, very rigorous self-analysis is, is uh, vitally important. Um, and uh, I'll just go back to this fundamental issue about substance and, and style. Uh, but before, I just want to show another book that is about to be released. Uh, of course, you can see the familiar title. It's not just a tribute to the Game of Thrones, though I'm a big fan. Uh, but also, this is my... Um, uh, take on, on history. Um, it's somehow is this my response to, to the idea that was very popular in the beginning of the 90s among all of us, that the, you know, the history was coming to an end. And the best-selling book of Francis Fukuyama was titled The End of History. You know, Cold War was over, Soviet Union and the communist system collapsed. We looked in the future with great, great optimism. Uh, now, it didn't work out exactly. So that's why the history goes in seasons. And we're entering a cold season. And what we should do, we should A, analyze why it's happened, and B, you know, find out how can we meet it you know, uh, uh, with adequate response. So I also had a you know, few more uh, you know, pictures there, just to show the, uh, uh, the importance of this moment in history. Uh, you may ask me why you know, Obama, Putin, we understand why Clinton and uh, Yeltsin are there. Actually, this is something that we'll, uh, we'll cover a bit later, but it's, it's, um, it's an idea that things are connected. Something that happens here and at a certain time may affect you later. This is a big picture. That's what I know from playing chess. You, you make a move on the queen side, so at move 15. Now, you should remember that at move 25, it can backfire or it could bring you benefits on the king side, so 10 moves later. So, uh, in 1995, very few people remember that, but I read Clinton's memoir, that's how I learned it. Uh, Clinton raised with Yeltsin an issue of Iranian nuclear program. How many people remember that? It was just the beginning. And uh, Yeltsin said, oh, well, well, it was just, okay. Clinton, they hugged, and that's it. 20 years ago. 
Imagine that Clinton could be more persistent at that time when Russia depended on America, you know, just its Russian economy was not, you know, in great shape. And uh, I think political climate was not good to support crazy mullahs, you know, with, with uh, their nuclear program. Again, the problem is that one year before, Bill Clinton made another mistake by uh, signing an agreement with North Korea. Who remembers that? North Korea signed a treaty in exchange for humanitarian aid and, uh, you know, some opening up. They would quit their nuclear program. Did they? No, they didn't. So it's next year, Iranians looked at them and said, wait a second. If a tiny North Korea could uh, start, start playing this nuclear blackmail, why not us? We're much bigger. And 20, 20 years later, we have Vladimir Putin, who learning from this, okay, North Korea, a bucket of nuclear waste. I, Vladimir Putin, control thousand nuclear warheads. What about me playing this game? If it worked for them, if it worked for Iranians, why shouldn't it work for me? Unfortunately, it's the algorithm is still in place, it's still working, and that's what tells you that, you know, you cannot separate events. We live in a global world, so everything is connected. If uh, money keeps traveling around the world, labor, uh, uh, information, so the terrorism, so the bad ideas, the social media is not Good, neither bad. It just sends information one way or another. But it could be any information. And uh, we should remember that uh, bad guys also learn how to use it for their, for their advantage. So it's about the big picture, and uh, I will uh, try to, to put it in, uh, in, in bigger perspectives, uh, because we'll talk about also artificial intelligence and other important issues. Now, as I said, we, we move now to style and substance. And that's very important, because often you hear, you know, okay, whatever, you know, this is the, is, is the, whoever is the audience, you are too probably defensive, or you're too aggressive, so you have to be cautious, more cautious, or you have to be, to be more dynamic. Forget it. You know, it's, some of us could become more aggressive or more cautious, but this is not universal advice. It's all about your own substance, which should, you know, should dictate your style. I put, you know, again, you look at the pictures. Kasparov, Karpov, those who play ch chess, they know that, you know, we, we have a very different style, like ice and fire. Karpov was a world champion, I was a world champion. He played more, I would say, strategic defensive chess. I played more aggressive chess. Both of us won, though I won the matches against him. But later, I you know, lost the match to Vladimir Kramnik, who were more like Karpov. So it's just, it's... No difference. Federer and Nadal, powerful surf, rushing to the net, or playing from the baseline. Both were number one. Uh, you probably recognize the, the soccer uniform, football. Brazil, Italy. You know, Jogo Bonito, Brazilian style versus Catenaccio. Five times world champions, four times world champions. Brazil five, Italy four. So, Sometimes Brazilians won. This is the first match I remember. I was seven years old, watched Brazil crushing Italy in 1970. So it was 4-1, was last match of Pele. Uh, but Italy won in 1982, great match, for instance. So um, it's about your ability to force the opposition to play your game. I always want to, you know, just like a, a graphic example. Uh, imagine the med medieval battle, uh, battlefield. And you have two armies, roughly even in strength, but in different, different compositions, clashing. Of course, it depends very much on the, on the ability of the generals, but at the end of the day, if one army has a very powerful cavalry and another one has skillful archers, the outcome of the battle will depend mostly on the landscape. If it's on the valley, yes, cavalry probably will smash them. If the battle goes to the hills, the archers will probably bring down uh, the... the um, uh, the cavalry. So it's, it's your ability to be very uh, precise in drawing the, the battlefield plan based on your understanding of your own strengths and weaknesses and also understanding the nature of the opposition you are facing at this exact, exact battle. And also, you should remember, and again, you all have great business experience here. Uh, I don't, but I, my, my professional experience tells me, no matter how much time you invest in preparation, most likely, the crucial decisions will be made in the time trouble, isn't it? There will be a moment when you have to make a big decision and, and time is, okay, in chess, the clock is ticking, but you're running out of time, and if at this moment you are not 
playing a game you are comfortable with, the chances of you make a mistake will be much higher. Because at that moment, we decide by instinct. We don't have time to just to, to check you know, things inst instinctively. So if you are a defensive player, you'd better play in a cautious environment. If you are a more aggressive player, you'd better create a very sharp situation that will benefit you. Because instinctively, you'll make a decision and the chances that your instincts are right are much higher in the situation that fits your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, nature as a decision maker. Um, Okay, now we move to, to computers because it's also in a, it's, it's another important issue. Uh, how much information we can draw from, from the screen? Because it's natural instincts, it's from, the ki from kids. So they look at the screen and many of them believe that the answer is there. It's all about, you know, just looking for more pages, you know, sliding through, you know, these, uh, you know, different uh, sites. And if you collect enough information, you'll have a right answer. I guess it's wrong. Because we all have, you know, the same access, and uh, I don't think you can compete for a competitive edge just trying to sort of to win on split of a second. Okay, unless you are an arbitrary, you know, finance, but most of you doing, you know, real business on the ground. So this, you have to uh, make sure that you make a quality decision based on the information. But what gives you a potential, potentially competitive edge is your ability to stop at the right moment. Again. It's an instinctive decision. No machine can tell you that this information is enough because, you know, it's never enough. You always want to get more. The problem is that from a certain point, you know, it will be counterproductive because you will be wasting time on bringing in your human intuition, which is, by the way, quite important. And matching, you know, this, the human creativity, human intuition with machines' brute force of calculation, it's absolutely vital for a successful decision-making which could give you an edge over your competitors. Um, and I, I was thinking about, um, about uh, some kind of an example, you know, and I looked for different quotes. Ironically, I believe the best quote comes from someone who's so, so far away from the computer world. Pablo Picasso. Computers are useless because they only give you answers. It sounds like a paradox, but that's, you know, I believe it's a unique piece of wisdom. Because it all starts with the question. And unless you ask the right question, you will never get a, the right answer. If your question is wrong, if your, your sort of original introduction of the, of the theme is wrong, machine could analyze it for a billion years. It will come up with the wrong answer. So it's very important that we lead the way. We play the role of a guide in just in using this immense power of calculation, which we have on our desk, or often in, I don't have one, in our pocket. Um, and um, you know, following this, you know, um, uh, these uh, um, ideas, so I um, made a visit to uh, probably the largest hedge fund in the world, it's called Bridgewater. And the reason I went there, because they hired Dave Ferrucci. And he is one of the leading AI researchers in the world, and he was a part of the Watson team. So uh, I wanted to talk to him, and uh, it's quite amazing that, you know, somebody left IBM to work for a hedge fund to have uh, sort of more resources available for his further research. It's a modern reality. So again, another paradox of the modern world. And I talked, I talked to him and his team about, you know, Picasso and, and these issues, and uh, I wanted to hear, you know, the greatest experts in the field. Now, his response to Picasso was that, no, 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 computers can ask questions. They just don't know which ones are important. Actually, you know, I think it's very mm, scholastic, so, so it's, the, it's, um, it's, it's, not, it's not a real refutation of Picasso. Because, you know, if they don't know what is the right question, so that's it, you know, they, they can keep asking questions. It still doesn't deny uh, the idea, the thesis, that humans should somehow intervene and to guide the machine, and without these, you know, grains, the most valuable grains of human contribution, machine will not be as powerful as it could be uh, if we just bring together these two, uh, uh, two different um, entities, you know, us, you know, uh, 
blood and flesh and uh, the silicon monster. Um, and uh, I, you know, I was quite impressed, by the way, by um, uh, Watson, because it's, it's a software uh, response to the issue, while the famous, or I would say infam infamous, Deep Blue uh, uh, was a hardware project. And um, I just uh, looked at, uh, at, at uh, the Watson performance, and I also just trying to, trying to explain it, so I uh, uh, came up with a little test. Because the challenges that Watson faced, and actually any machine will be facing, they're quite, you know, quite impressive. So this is a question. That chicken is too hot to eat. So what's the, what's the right answer? So um, it's, it's quite amazing that, you know, at that level, Watson was able more or less to identify whether it's food or a crazy chicken. So whether it's uh, on our plate or just running crazy in the backyard. Um, and uh, um, again, then I wanted to move on, so just to um, understand, you know, sort of the, the nature of this future cooperation. But of course, it just, it, it could open, you know, an endless discussion. And I, you know, for the um, last few years, I've been involved in, in debating these issues. And um, as um, a senior visiting fellow of Oxford Martin School, I show up there on the uh, annual basis, and always one of my lectures or workshops is related to man and machine because that's now become this is the, 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 the key topic uh, of the conversation, how we can bring together man and machine. And chess offers you absolutely unique opportunity to test human intuition and brute force of calculation because you can bring together man and machine, that what I call advanced chess or freestyle chess, playing against another man or with machine or a group of people. So you can definitely have variety of combinations bringing uh, human brains and, and machines power and to see how they, you know, they correlate in the real battle where decisions uh, are made. Just very, very briefly, it's just the, when people ask me, and this, it's like, you know, I'm, maybe there will be a question I want to preempt it, why it's so difficult for humans to play the machine? And it's probably again, relevant to our conversation today. I mean, forget the uh, power of calculation and, and, and the machines that could see through just a million moves ahead, it's not true. Chess is a mathematically infinite game with number of uh, legal moves is 10 power 45, so more than number of atoms in the solar system. The g biggest problem that we're all facing, and it's irreparable, we cannot play one game, even one game, with the level of precision required to be the machine, because we always make not even mistakes, inaccuracies. Human game is always filled with some kind of tiny, tiny problem. So even if we won the brilliant game, I bet you there will be tiny inaccuracies there. You play human chess, you know, top, top players. You make 45 good moves, four brilliant moves, and one inaccuracy. It's enough to win. The same against the machine, most likely the, the win will slip through your fingers because machine will benefit. Machine doesn't care what was there two moves ago. So it always, you know, looks at the position and, and it always pushes through. So that's why you have to be vigilant way beyond human ability to concentrate even throughout one game. So that's, again, yeah, that's the limitations of our nature. So we have to accept it. And uh, as a final advice uh, to wrap up this, this part of the conversation, you know, if you lost the game, you know, you have to go back to analyze what's happened. You won the game, you open the champagne, you celebrate, you won because you. Okay, we are great. This is we know. Remember, you won, somebody lost. Normally, there are more losers than winners. So those who lost keep analyzing the game. And as I just said a minute ago, every game contains elements of, of not mistakes, maybe inaccuracies. So you have to find it before before the others find it, and next, next, at next game, at next battle, at next political campaign, at next business deal, you can surprise your opponents by being again at the cutting edge. That's why I stayed on top for 20 years. I believe that every game, every game, whether I won it or not, provided me unique background about my own game, my opponents, and, and enough information to work out something new for the next battle. So uh, now we talk about some new frameworks. Uh, so I... Uh, just want to use names that are familiar to everybody. I hope so. Um, so, inventors of aeroplane, Wright brothers. Bank Laboratories, 
maybe less familiar, but a dominant force in the, in the market, late 60s, early 70s. Alta Vista, remember the name? So it's first searchable index of the internet. Oh, okay, um, okay, yes. First old screen smartphone. Innovators, winner, dominant market share. Next list. Boeing, Toshiba, Google, iPhone. So people and companies on that list, they ask bigger questions, actually new questions. So Boeing, he didn't know him how to fly when he started his business, but he kept investing in business before it became a business. So he has been working hard by hiring people and building some of the infrastructure to be ready for the moment when market was ready to embrace this new industry. And by the way, it's just uh, he has been operating in a country where many scientists believe that airplanes were not, you know, um, an important uh, factor for the future economy. By the end of the World War I, America, that has by far the largest um, aut aut automobile productions in the world, was the last among developed nations in, in aviation. So, okay, I don't think you have to say anything about Toshiba, Google, iPhone, and then let's bring them together, this list. So we all flew to Helsinki, or most of us. We didn't fly Wright Brothers airplane. We did fly either Boeing or Airbus. Okay, it's the, I was in, Bo in Boeing. So uh, now Vang Laboratories, so even not, not everybody remembers that, so you have Toshiba again, because they saw the bigger picture. They were you know, more aggressive, they realized what is required. So uh, Alta Vista, Google, I always say that if you want to find out what's happen what happened with Alta Vista, you can Google it. <laughs> now, I know it's a bit painful, but the company is bust. If you drop from 48% of the market share to 3%, you know, that tells you that something is wrong. And uh, what's, what got wrong? Apps. They missed this moment. So 2007, 2008, 47 point something percent of the market. Now it's, you have to look through microscope to find the share. Happens. And of course, iPhone dominates. But it's not just iPhone dominates, the concept dominates. Because the largest, uh, largest share is it's, it's, it's Samsung, when you look at it again. The last time I checked, it was two hours ago. Um, now, that this, you know, the story of these companies, you know, it could give us ideas, you know, so that even if you are facing a pioneer, somebody who, who dominates the market, you still have an opportunity to catch up or even to go, you know, ahead if you, if you can come up, you know, with sort of a bigger picture, if you could take a little bit of a risk and just to understand how to sort of surpass the, um, the leaders, because often the leaders are, you know, are um, infected by what I call the gravity of past success. That's why you feel the weakness and as you can, uh, you can uh, capitalize on it. Now, um, just to give another idea about the big picture and the way we move forward, um, Kurt Gödel, mathematician, probably as important for mathematics in the 20th century as Albert Einstein for physics, I was honored to speak at his uh, centenary in Vienna in 2006, so I learned something about uh, his works, and I was truly impressed that Gödel's theorem can be applied to business, to, uh, to politics, to anything, because it says that every system will contain a problem that cannot be solved from within the system itself. So basically, it means that no matter how far we go horizontally, at a certain point, we will, not be, we will not be able to find decision within this framework, at this layer of the development of our civilization. We have to go up. But going up means that you take risk. So again, longer you stay at the horizontal level, is gravity, is gravity of past success. Gravity brings you down because you, you don't want to leave your comfort zone. And, um, and uh, so uh, moving forward, you know, I wanted to actually analyze this, I call it cultural phenomena. And uh, now, in 2015, if you want to analyze something, you use modern technology. And I did. Google Ngram, 
And I did a little search. So um, the first one, you know, um, you can look at this. So uh, um, uh, it's television, telephone, and computer. And by the way, it's the, the engram means that you know you go through millions of books. It's all the data, and uh, how often the word is repeated and being used. So you can see that it works all you know nicely. So it's the uh, naturally you know the television appears later because it was not there. Same with with um, with computer. Telephone you know was going down, but with mobile uh, mobile phones you know it's slightly it went slightly up. So you could see that. So it works. That was a test. Now let's move to another one. So you have two names there. So two two uh, elements: uh, invention, uh, uh, profit, uh, and um, what is the third one? The blue one, the one that made a sort of huge jump over the mixed uh, 60s. I guess you can come up with a simple answer. Risk. What, what does it mean? That we suddenly discovered risk. If we keep using this word all the time, it means that you know, we, we're trying to avoid it. We're trying to minimize it. We're trying to manage it. And I think it's a, it's a cultural phenomenon. And uh, at the time when we discovered it, and we tried to sort of to minimize the risk by still trying to keep our profits intact, um, we have been sliding down, but it's, it's like a very, very slow process because we had so many you know, great things that happened to us already, and uh, we have been uh, uh, benefiting dramatically from the great things that have been invented in the 50s and 60s, and, uh, and by the way, this is the, it's, it's a funny trivia question. Uh, when was the first mobile telephone call made? What year? Registered. 1973. In 1962, there was um, a theoretical work describing packet switching, which is the foundation of internet. The first message on ARPANET, which is the you know, prototype of internet, was sent in 1969. So that's why when we think it's, it's great things happening now, just remember it's, it's more or less we're dealing with commercial applications of great things that have been invented uh, um, uh, before. And uh, it, it has a profound you know, effect everywhere because we're trying to sort of to avoid risky things. Yeah, for instance, we, you know, we are no longer exploring deep oceans or outer space. The last man walking on the moon, 1972. Eugene Cernan. Uh, do we have an ability to fly? Yes, we do. We, we think it's irrelevant. The problem is, when you do something risky, you don't know exactly what will be the outcome. Very often I hear people asking me, you're telling us to do risky things, yet can you tell exactly, you know, you know, this big innovation, how much will it cost and how, or how much time will it take? My response is, if you know how much and, and, and how long, it's obsolete. So uh, aggressive environment, you know, filled with risk, opens enormous opportunities for things that we, we couldn't expect. The, the GPS, internet, and many other great things came out of the space race as a side effect. So that's why there are benefits of looking at the big picture and employing risk. Because if we try to push risk away, sticking with, uh, uh, only with, you know, with the idea that benefits could be, you know, could be there in any case. So we are risking to jeopardize the entire concept of, of, of the free market. So we just have to remember that you know, risk is risk and uh, the wrong things can happen, but we represent more, much more than just you know, an individual or, or group of people. We are the human race and uh, we are, the, we are responsible for so many great things that happened uh, before, and we have to make sure that you know, this, this pioneer spirit doesn't, doesn't go away. Because individuals shape the culture, but then it's like boomerang, it comes back, and it also shapes us. So I thought that this, this, this is something like, you know, um, 
like a, a cultural phenomena. And uh, uh, I think people are just now talking about risk, about certain problems that the free market is facing in the world, about liberal democracies now so also reaching certain limits. They talk about innovation slowing down, but then you have to bring all together. We just have to see the big picture to understand the cause and effect. And I believe that, um, so we, uh, we will inevitably come back to the same pioneer spirit that uh, you know, made Western civilization so the, the driving force of the, of the global, global changes. And, uh, and this morning I did a talk on, on uh, politics. Uh, and then I, if I was asked questions at the press conference and at two interviews. And all these questions, as you can guess, were about politics, about um, current global affairs, about the threat coming from Vladimir Putin's Russia. And, um, of course, one of the questions is always, and I guess it might be already asked, you know, on Twitter here, so that's why I can try to give you my preemptive, preemptive answer. Uh, it's not a preemptive strike. Uh, what to do? So what can we do? So we have business ties, but also we are dealing with somebody who's so strong, so dangerous. And I always responded to this question saying, you know, don't insult my intelligence saying that Vladimir Putin is so dangerous today, even more dangerous than Joseph Stalin in 1948, when Harry Truman decided to open the air bridge to West Berlin to save the city uh, from Soviet occupation and did it for 11 months. And Stalin didn't sh shoot a single American or British plane because he knew there would be a response. Dictators always know where they can push or where they should back off. That's why they're, they're dictators and that's why they are staying in power for so long. But I just, you know, when I was walking to this hall, I thought, why on earth I was talking to Finnish audience or just our friends from neighboring countries about Harry Truman, about Berlin, about uh, Western Europe. I guess in your own history, you can find an answer for the question where the risk is worth taking. What were the chances of tiny Finland 75 years ago to resist Soviet aggression? No tanks, no aviation, massive army crossing the border. Was it more um, appropriate to give up and to save lives? Finland sacrificed 26,000 people, well, I checked. It was a huge sacrifice for a small country. But the result of this heroic defense was that you preserved your independence. While your cousins across the channel or across the, the bay, and no offense meant to my Estonian friends, or to their neighbors from, Estonia, from Latvia and Lithuania, they gave up. How many Estonians perished in Stalin's concentration camps? More than you sacrificed in your fight for independence. The, the odds were against you, and you didn't care, because you knew there was something more important than calculating the odds. Actually, it was of my favorite moments in Star, Star Wars. When I was 17, I saw the Empire Strikes Back. And when they entered the asteroid field, remember the robot telling, our chances to survive in the asteroid field is 3,720 to 1. And Hans Solo replied, never tell me the odds. Uh, I think it's, it's hypothetical, and you say, oh, the things could be worse. Ask Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, could it be worse? Losing the cream de la cream of the nation in Stalin concentration camps and then 50 years of Soviet occupation? We are all facing tough choices. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, we're responsible for our decisions. And I believe that, you know, um, today we reached the point when, you know, when we see, see the big picture, the bigger picture, so we understand that risk is always worth taking because that's what moves us forward. And I'll try to finish this presentation on a more um, enlightening note. Uh, the Angry Birds here is not because it's a finished product. Uh, this is, I wish I, I had my iPhone or Samsung, I have both actually. Um, 
In my pocket, I don't, but it doesn't matter. Another interesting trivia question. 1969, you could see this is the American on the moon and also the IBMers. 3,500 IBMers provided computer support to NASA. Can you imagine what was the entire computing power of NASA in 1969? You have more in your pocket. You have more in your pocket today. That's why when I hear people saying, no, 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 the great things have been invented already. So what can we do, you know, so now forget about it. All we can do is just incremental things, little things, you know. No, 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 we can do great things. And it's again culture, you know, the things changed. Steve Jobs in 1976, what was his dream? To come up with a big idea and to kill IBM. Today, to be Steve Jobs in Silicon Valley, their dream is to come up with a big idea and to sell it to Apple. You see the difference? Imagine these people operated with 128 28 kilobytes, 256 kilobytes, and they were able to calculate a trajectory to fly to the moon and then come back safely. Today we're dealing with terabytes and losing more satellites than they lost 50 years ago. When I say that we, uh, we can do better, it's, it's, and the, the um, innovations are slowing down, so I often hear, no, no, Mr. Kasparov, you and your friends, you are too pessimistic, so look, so many great things, iPhone 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, iPhone 6 is no match to Apollo 6. And actually, I'm telling my critics that I am an optimist because I believe in the human genius. I believe we can do better. I believe we missed so many great opportunities. And when I talk to the young audience, that's why I brought you know, this little picture, the Finnish homemade product. I tell them that with the device in your pocket, you have a choice because there's so much computing power there to bring the man to the moon and back. Or you can keep throwing birds at pigs. And I just put one more picture, because everybody on Mon last Monday was watching Putin, Obama, talking in the United Nations. I had my editorial in the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago, and I said, look, the, the event was irrelevant because Putin didn't care what he said, and Obama didn't care what he said, because Obama knew he wouldn't act anyway, and Putin knew he would act no matter what. There's so much attention was thrown, you know, just it's from all over the world to this Jubilee General Assembly of the United Nations. And at the same day, NASA has announced that they found the traces of water on Mars. Tell me what will people remember in the future? Who cares about these politicians coming in and out? We'll forget about it. But there's a water on Mars. Maybe the crazy ideas, you know, promoted by great minds like Elon Musk, they could become reality. And why I believe we should try it, I would love to see us, maybe my son, walking on the red dust of Mars. But it's not about that. It's about creating new environment. Just imagine, you know, today, I'm sure the people here working in pharmaceutical companies, how many tests you have to pass to come up with a new drug? Is it possible to come up with something revolutionary? No. At one of my workshops in Oxford, uh, the man who runs the same lab as Alexander Fleming told bluntly that today penicillin will be killed at the first test. The allergy, every probably fifth person will create it. So today we are, we are operating in an environment where one mistake out of a thousand could put your product out of the market. Imagine we go to Mars and the chances of return, 50-50. You will welcome 30% risk. Suddenly it all it changes. Suddenly, it opens doors for, for human creativity, and we're very good at that. So, I know that me standing here telling you, take more risk, sounds a bit risky. But I believe that even if we make mistakes, 
And even something hap wrong ha happens with us, so we will still benefit as a human race and will eventually benefit, you know, as, as a company, as a corporation, as a family, as a country. Just imagine that these great explorers who crossed the oceans in 15th, 16th century, they didn't even have a map. We have a better chance reaching, you know, planets in the solar system than Magellan and Columbus to survive in the rough, untested waters. So, Let's not be afraid. Let's remember who we are and let's move forward. Thank you.